Committee on Higher Education will come to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chairman Dorman. Here. Vice Chair Gannon. Representative Razor. Here. Black. Kelly. Here. Kendrick. Here. Prouty. Here. Sean. Here. Shields. Trent. Here. Having a quorum, we will uh, proceed into regular business. I'm going to turn the chair over to Representative Prouty until the vice chair arrives and uh, we'll have the hearing on House Bill 2696. And you may proceed when you get ready. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, House Bill 2696 is the uh, Campus Free Expression Bill, my annual uh, attempt in Missouri. Um, it encourages free, exp free expression, inquiry, exchange of information, and honest open debate on uh, Missouri public uh, campuses, prohibits suppression of free speech, expression, or association, protect protects equal access on campus, uh, asks professors to deliver the subject matter that they are uh, responsible for teaching, and uh, makes certain that campus guests will be treated with the respect due guests rather than to be uh, uh, physically or verbally abused. Be glad to answer any questions. Okay, any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Oh, sorry, Representative Reiser. We're not going to get through this bill that easily. <laughs> so, did you want to comment this is the greatest bill you ever seen? It, I'm not sure I'm there yet. Oh, okay. but I think your intentions are good with this. Um, well, I think we've made some progress. Yeah. Um, a few things, and I'm trying to find one right now. I thought I had it marked. Uh, I will just jump to something else I was going to bring up. So in the definition of faculty, you have included lecturers. So I guess that would mean guest lecturers. And guest lecturers should... <coughs> should be careful not to introduce controversial matters that have no relationship to the subject taught. Where, where are we at? So just in the definition of what faculty is, you okay. include lecturers. Then on page four in section nine, we're saying faculty shouldn't introduce controversial. A guest lecturer would not be hired by the university. These are all employees of the, of the university or college. <clears throat> Tenure, non-tenure professor. Okay, all right. Adjunct professors, visiting professors, lecturers, uh, graduate assistants, they're all, they're all paid by the university. Okay. Um, so then with a on-staff faculty member who introduces what is considered controversial, which we don't have a definition of, mm -hmm. a controversial matter that has no relationship to the subject taught, the institution and the faculty member can be sued. Is, is what this bill seems to set up, which, I mean, what if you're in, and I'm trying to think of a good example, but what if you're in a religious studies class and the professor brings up a controversial new design of a bridge that he or she has heard of? Mm -hmm. You have a student in there that has something against this particular professor. Now the professor's just introduced something they have no competency or training on, just an interesting article they read that is controversial in the engineering world. Now they just open themselves and the institution up to a lawsuit. You know, Representative, I'm going to let a witness comment on that. Okay. Um, 
there is a section in here. I'm wondering if you meant it to be this way or if it was just the way it was drafted on page five, section nine. Uh, section nine, okay. You say severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive. Did you mean and or should that be or? Because it could be severe and pervasive, but not offensive, or it could be severe and offensive. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll take that under advisement. Okay. And then on page three, uh, the very first paragraph where it, it kind of gets rid of free speech zones and makes the entire campus a free speech zone. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure the way this is written. I, I wonder about a protest that might pop up spontaneously outside of a classroom that's disruptive of the classroom or students taking a test um, and the university then can't do anything about it. I think uh, within the body of the bill, anything that becomes obstructive of the general business of the university is a, is not taken under this um, umbrella of free speech. To to um, for instance, to block access to a particular classroom would not be considered. Where free is that speech. in here? Well, I think under the uh, umbrella of the bill that. You're talking about allowing people to express themselves, not to obstruct the business of the university. It, I think that's we're, we're, we're on. <coughs> yeah. Okay. It's already there. It is there. I'm going to let the witness speak to that. But it is there. Rest assured. That, that concern is covered. Okay, we may come back to that. Yeah, okay. okay. All right, thank you. Fair enough. Any other questions? Really quickly, I'm thinking what um, Representative Dorman is speaking of is on page two, um, it would be section three, lines 48, where it says, uh, I'll go up one, section two, the provisions of this section should be um, known and cited as the Campus Free Expression Act. It goes on to say expansive activities protected under the provisions of this section include, but are not limited to all forms of peaceful assembly, protest speeches, distribution of literature, carrying signs and circulating petitions. Section three, the outdoor areas of campus and public institutions of higher learning in this state shall be deemed traditional public forums. Public institutions of higher education may maintain and enforce reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions in service of a significant institutional interest only when such restrictions employ clear published content neutral um, and viewpoint neutral criteria that goes on. I'm thinking along those lines is where they're talking about um, ensuring um, the disruption free assembly. And I could be wrong, but I'm thinking that's where that would be covered. Yes, Madam Chair, that's. Thank you. Any other questions? Representative, who? okay, Trent, sorry. <laughs> Just saw the back of his head. To inquire. Proceed, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, do you think that the language that you've crafted here uh, would be successful in uh, curtailing, if not eliminating, what, what we commonly refer to as the heckler's veto. Uh, you think that's one of the goals you're trying to achieve here? It's one of them. One of the main goals. Uh, but, you know, people pulling fire alarms and this and that, what, what do you do, right? Well, and, and in a sense, that, that isn't a heckler's veto as well. Where where someone's creating a disruption either a disruption directly or indirectly, the person cannot speak, right? Uh, and and that's the phenomenon, uh, and and where the interplay I think comes here that, that I would have a question about is um, things like public safety and insurance costs and all the other things that 
are used as a as an excuse to um, shut down a a speech event. Uh, and I think under your language, it would still be possible uh, for a university if there's going to be exorbitant uh, costs or there's going to be uh, you know, some kind of acute public safety interest. They would still be able to shut that event down, but they would just have to make sure there are adequate alternative venues for that speech to be heard. Is that yes. the intent? Okay. That's the intent. Because uh, I think that's probably the biggest way in which uh, there, there's been an attempt to try to evade some of these heckler veto prohibitions. Uh, and then I also wanted to touch on uh, the controversial subjects issue, uh, because as I read it, that's, that's controversial subjects that's sort of outside the purview of, of the competency of the, of the instructor. Uh, outside the subject matter of and, the course and the, and the uh, expert, well, nothing wrong with a professor having a, an opinion about whatever, but to go, you know, continually promote that opinion it's not subject matter of the course becomes an issue. And, and it sort of becomes, it's almost a, it's not a contract issue. It almost sort of looks like a contract issue because you have purchased uh, education in a specific area. And to the extent which a portion of that class is devoted to something that isn't that area, no matter how well intended, no matter how innocuous, I mean, I would say even if it were non-controversial, if it were outside the purview of that class, and in some sense the student is not receiving the service that they paid for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this seems like a, a, a broader concern uh, to the extent that it might be happening than just strictly related to controversial subjects. Um, so if anything, uh, and I, I don't think it's within the purpose of this bill, but if it, within, if anything, this might be an area where you would want to expand um, or at least uh, an area where we might want to consider um, whether or not the education that's being purchased is finally tailored to what the student is seeking. Um, and then just kind of as a comment, um, you know, I, I think it's always um, difficult when we try to step into this sphere mm -hmm. uh, to legislate uh, but I think it's important uh, because universities have such a central role in our society as opinion shaping uh, institutions, not just for the students who are there, uh, but through the academic work that they do, uh, media, government, industry, uh, they, they serve a, an outsized role in, in shaping the direction of our society. And so the, the public interest is particularly acute uh, in this area. So I appreciate you bringing this bill forward, gentlemen. And, and I will say I, um, I applaud the University of Missouri for taking a step forward and adopting a policy. I think that's the right direction. Um, maybe we can enhance that a bit. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you, Representative. Thank you. I don't think I identified myself for the record. Representative Dean Dorman from the 51st District. Very good. Any witnesses in favor? Please come and please make sure that you fill out a witness form and leave it. Thank you very much. And you can proceed when you're ready. Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee, uh, my name is Joe Cohn. I'm the Legislative and Policy Director at the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, or as we're better known, FIRE. I have testified in front of this committee a few times, but many of the faces have turned over since I've been here. Um, FIRE, for those of you who don't know, is a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization that defends free speech and due process on university campuses exclusively, and we do it for faculty and students on every part of the political spectrum. We have defended people who have been censored, advocating on either side of every single controversial issue you can name and litigated on those, and we've done a lot of the faculty uh, cases on behalf of faculty. Um, we're strongly in support of this bill, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about answer, first answering the questions that I heard from the committee, and then uh, any further questions that you had, um, I'd pr I'm probably the right person to, to direct them to, having done uh, campus free speech work and in particular statutory stuff for uh, now uh, moving on nine years. And before that, I was the legal director of two ACLU affiliates. So um, 
with that, I want to talk to you a little bit about why we started coming to legislatures in the first place. And Missouri was the second legislature we came to when we passed the bill dealing specifically with free speech zones uh, that you see in the non-bolded text here is what's already been enacted. The reason why we came to legislatures was because even though there was very strong First Amendment precedent, um, there was a huge hole in the authority uh, which is that there are two ways you can be censored. You can, uh, you can be either punished for protected speech or you can be prevented from speaking in the first place. That's the second category being called prior restraints. Well, on the first category of cases, courts were having no problem seeing that there were damages that were available when that happened. But on the second category, they weren't recognizing that, so they were only viewing these issues in terms of injunctive relief. The problem with that is that when a student graduates, they're no longer eligible for injunctive relief. And there's a whole body of cases, you know, because there's no longer live uh, controversy. There's a whole body of cases about things being able to evade review and capable of repetition. But the test that the Supreme Court set for that requires it to be the same parties in the same dynamic over and over again. Think a woman who's getting pregnant, for example, might be in that same relationship in the future with the state. But that isn't true of students who graduate. So our solution was to liquidate some of the damages, and we didn't care how much, so that no matter what happened, if the court thought there was a violation, they had to keep the case until opinion. That was the reason why. So none of this bill is an attempt at all to change what the legal authority says. And it feeds off of a lot of Supreme Court uh, case law. Uh, one of the questions, Representative Razor, you asked was about the definition of harassment. You asked about the and versus or uh, in the definition. Well, that comes straight from the United States Supreme Court in a case called Davis versus Monroe County Board of Education. And there, the court distinguishes and has several pages dedicated to why it was important to be and in the educational context, whereas in the employment context, they use or. Because in the employment context, you're there to get the boss's job done. And if you're rocking the boat, you're making it more difficult. That's a real problem. And bosses are allowed to intervene sooner uh, to, to make sure they're smooth operations. But in the educational context, they set one standard, and they set one standard for both higher ed and K through 12. And they said, you know, we expect there to be more clashes. You can't think about the person who says something particularly severe but is told the first time, knock it off. Should that person be subject to having their education ended? At the end of the day, you're still talking about words. Um, and the Supreme Court says no. And they go on at great length, and it's uh, an O'Connor opinion joined by the four uh, liberal justices uh, at the time, Breyer, Souter, Stevens, uh, and Ginsburg. And the dissent wanted it to be an even higher standard, more speech protective. They were concerned that even that would lead to more campus censorship. So that's why it has uh, the, the and. Um, did you want to ask me more about that before I talk about some of the other questions you all asked? Okay, I don't see any further questions. Well, uh, you can go ahead and finish your testimony before okay, we take sorry. questions. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Um, in terms of uh, the faculty, uh, I don't think it does anticipate having guest lecturers uh, being included in that if what you're envisioning by a guest lecturer is someone who comes once and comes to a podium and, and speaks. But anyone who is there in a classroom environment needs to have the ability to say what they want. And I, th I think the conversation that Representative Trent started, I think, was uh, hit the nail right on the head. Later versions of this same text that you see struck the word controversial for the reasons that Representative Trent you know, identified. And FIRE supports that if you choose to go that route. Because the question isn't whether or not it's controversial. The question is whether or not it's germane and uses up a lot of class time. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the paragraph is speech protective because what it says, that first half that you're identifying with that line of controversial stuff is all resolution. That's not binding. It's the second sentence that says, provided that they can't be punished unless it's not reasonably germane and takes up a lot of class time. And that's the test that a majority of the circuits have used. The reason why this is important, and this might be the one area where, where, where it is establishing to some extent some law here, um, is that there is a circuit split, and your circuit hasn't addressed the question yet at all yet, about whether or not faculty have, at public institutions, have First Amendment rights that fall under the umbrella of academic freedom almost at all. 
And the reason why that came into jeopardy is that in 2006, there's a Supreme Court case called Garcetti versus Sabalos. That was not a higher ed case, but it was a case where an assistant prosecutor whistle blew on one of his colleagues who was manipulating evidence in trials and falsifying it. And he's up later for promotion, and the boss passes him over, and he sues. And you know, there's a smoking gun memo where he says, I'm not promoting this guy who's not a team player, even though it was clear whistleblowing. And the Supreme Court has to go up on the question about whether or not his speech was clearly relevant to his work function and whether or not an employer at a public employer has of such a high interest in the smooth operations of the government office that they can intervene on speech that's otherwise relevant. And in a shocker, and I think both sides of the political spectrum found it to be a shocker, they say because it was relevant at all, you know, they get rid of the pickering conic test, which used to be a balancing test of the interests, and they say no uh, protected right there. And the dissent in the case raises the issue of academic freedom. It says that rule is particularly threatening on college campuses where we expect people to have academic freedom. And the majority says that might be true, but that's not the case before us today, so we're going to leave that for a day when that issue is briefed. And since then, the circuits have been split. A third of the circuits haven't addressed it at all. You're in one of those circuits. Uh, a third of the circuits have said it's a no-brainer that you need an academic freedom exception. And a third have said not until the Supreme Court tells us to. So this is the rule, this is the, the, the framework that is used in the circuits that have decided that you have academic freedom in the, in the classroom. That is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the only way in which the bill departs from what the case law says from the Supreme Court is the only way in which you are establishing anything uh, new. And it's, again, that second half of the paragraph that protects the faculty member for what they say in the classroom, even when it is controversial. The only time it's not protected is when it is not germane and uses up a substantial amount of class time. And that standard was borrowed by the courts from the AAUP statements um, over the years. Uh, so, that's, so that's the origin there and why, and why that's there. Um, I'm trying to make sure I address any other matters that you had. I think I got the ones that you raised. Um, you were asking about protests outside the classroom. Uh, Madam Chairman, you were correct about, about the language that prevents that. Um, origins of that case law is Ward versus Rock against racism, Supreme Court case law where they were trying to figure out um, when governments can regulate speech in public places. If you think about it, your offices are public spaces, but they're not there for people to protest. They're there for you to get your work done. So there are different rules there, and they try to figure out, is it a traditional public forum? Is it a different kind of forum? Well, the courts are overwhelmingly saying that open outdoor areas of college campuses look more like the traditional public forums, where these rules, the rules that set forth in the bill you already passed, applies. But those rules are not uh, so stringent that universities can't prevent the kind of disruptions. With respect to heckler's vetoes, this is the last point I'll make because I know I'm going long and it's technical and you've had a long day. Um, with respect to heckler's vetoes, the language you have here is, uh, is non-binding in that it describes what would count as a substantial material disruption, but it does not require the universities to engage in any particular punitive action even when things cross the line. Just as from our perspective as a legislature, this is what we want you to consider when evaluating when speech does cross the line here. FIRE worked on that language with organizations from both sides of the political spectrum and every part of, you know, of the civil rights community to come up with that language because it was a really tough nut to crack in terms of finding the right line and allowing there to be robust protest, but also making sure that speakers weren't subject to heckler's vetoes, as numerous courts have said, stopping people from speeches when they have a reserved spot is unlawful. So that's the general gist of the most dry version of the presentation I've ever given. But I really wanted to dive in and answer your more challenging uh, challenging questions. Um, and uh, I want to thank you for, for your time today. Thank you. Any questions for the witness? Representative Raven. How have the courts uh, defined what a substantial amount of class time is? Are we talking about half of a semester is on a different topic, or are we talking about five minutes of one class period? Right. So, so the courts haven't gone into that and set, at least the Supreme Court hasn't gone into it and set, like, here's the definitive standard here. Anytime you have a con law test of any kind, you're going to try to describe things as in ordinary plain language and let facts kind of hash it out in front of, in front of courts. Um, what we have 
how we've analyzed it at FIRE is not uh, whether or not it was half of a semester, which I think is beyond. Uh, but we also, the general gist is that we're trying to be as protective as possible of any kind of fleeting stuff. We defend faculty all the time who get in disciplinary proceedings because they mentioned that they supported Trump or they supported Hillary or they supported whomever, and maybe they might do it for 20 seconds before each class, and that might really be grating to people who don't want to hear from the soapbox, but that ultimately is protected. But if, as Representative Trent was talking about, someone was for 15 minutes of the 50-minute session, half of the time, going into stuff, at some point you're learning considerably less than the amount that you're supposed to be learning. Here's so the, it's, here's it's the a part fluid that, concept. Yeah, here's the part that, that bothers me about the bill or that concerns me mm -hmm. is I, I think there is a fundamental misunderstanding of higher education because there's kind of two types. One, there is, okay, I'm going to be a nurse and I need to learn the skills to be a nurse or I'm going to be an engineer and we're learning these math equations today. Then there are the arts and science classes where you are learning to think. And to learn to, how to think, you have to have discussions. And those discussions may veer off whatever the class started with that day. But that's how they work. That's how you learn how to think critically. And at what point are we now putting the institutions and professors at risk of frivolous lawsuits because a student in the class didn't like how the topic veered off that yeah, day. Yeah, I think it does actually the exact opposite. And, and if you look at the, and let's go to the actual language because I don't want to, you know, d debate it outside of the language. Um, so, although faculty are free in the classroom to discuss subjects within their competence, faculty should be cautious in expressing personal views in the classroom to persuade rather than illustrate or illuminate. And faculty should be careful not to introduce controversial matters, and again, I support crossing controversial if you'd like, um, that have no relation to the subject taught, especially matters which they have no special competence or training. Then there's a semicolon. So all of that is non-binding, okay? The next sentence is provided that no faculty shall face adverse employment action for classroom speech unless it is not reasonably germane to the subject matter. And that's what speaks directly to the point you're making here, the not reasonably germane to the subject matter. Um, and as broadly construed, which is the second clause which speaks to your concern, uh, and I share that concern, uh, by the way, because in liberal arts you want things to, you know, people use it, analogies. You talk about, you know, literature can cover any number of human experiences uh, type, of, type of issues. All of those things are designed to have a broad amount of protection. And that's why it's in the AAUP statements, historical statements on, uh, on academic freedom dating back to 1950. Uh, and again, when, when, uh, when they were amended in the 40s and again in the 70s, have kept this language in specifically to describe these kind of contours. So uh, it's that kind of language that tries to provide a safe harbor for faculty so that they're not in trouble when they do, do the kind of things that you're describing, which I agree with you are 100 percent appropriate and necessary in higher ed. Any further questions for this witness? Representative Flagg. Thank you. To inquire? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, you recited several cases, and I wasn't able to track them all. But with regard to this particular point that we're discussing now, uh, are there, are there, what is the authority? Is there Supreme Court authority so, on this particular issue with regard to how far faculty can go afield from the subject matter? The Supreme Court hasn't had that case yet. So has the eight. Has not, the Supreme Court hasn't had that has case yet. the Eighth yet. Circuit. N not to the best of my knowledge. Um, but there's been uh, several of the circuits, the Eighth, the Seventh, so Demers, um, McAdams uh, in the Fourth Circuit uh, case. Um, yep, Sixth Circuit has addressed it. There have been a bunch of circuits that, that have, have dealt with these. And a lot of these cases settle out before it gets to circuit level authority. But these have been the standards that it's been, that it's been debated upon, you know, about whether or not. And again, this dates back to the AAUP statements that have been the um, gold standard on on academic freedom for for generations. Um, 
bar these are literally the standards that are borrowed from those documents. Is there a Missouri District Court case of which you are aware? Or I, I don't, but I, I, I would have to look up to I see whether or not there were. the authority that you believe is germane to this particular paragraph that we that we keep discussing here. Can you provide that to the committee? I, I the, can. I probably can't do it before no, the end of this hearing today. No, I don't. I don't mean but, in the next five minutes. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy to, to to provide you information on this particular part of it, or any part you ask for. Yeah. So. Uh, Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Sorry to be so dry. Oh, you're fine. Any witnesses? Any witnesses opposed to this legislation? Please proceed when you are ready. Good evening. My name is Mo Delvilar. I am with the American Civil Liberties Union of Missouri. Um, I want to first say that the ACLU strongly supports and avidly protects the First Amendment, and the vast majority of this bill is pretty much okay with us. Um, one of the main concerns that we have is touching on um, what Representative Razor has already brought up in the and or definition for student against student harassment. Um, we feel as though requiring that conduct be severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive sets a standard too high. Um, the case relied upon by FIRE, um, the case Davis, deals with sexual harassment between students, um, and there are a lot of other situations where harassment can occur. Um, there have been cases where students have been racially discriminated against or racially harassed in terms of using slurs or epithets, even up to and including um, nooses being put around lockers or cars, and that has not met the standard of pervasive, severe, and objectively offensive. Um, so we feel as though remedying this issue can be made a lot easier for schools if this body would allow for that flexibility within the word or, as opposed to the word and. Um, we believe that speech does not merit constitutional protection when it targets for harm certain individuals, um, such as a true threat of physical violence or um, other unconstitutionally protected speech. I welcome any questions that you may have. Um, thank you. I'll start. Would you all be in favor of the bill if that and was turned to or? Sure. Okay. I mean, there's a couple things. If we if we can make some changes, we can make some changes. But if I was going to pull a punch, it would be for that one. Okay. So what are the other changes in your seat? He's already. He's he, addressed them. Yeah. So he, okay. they're yeah. open to possibly removing the word controversial, which we were cool with. Um, again, we feel as though changing it from and to or would expand the the actual intent of the bill, which is protecting students um, in an educational environment. Okay, thank you. Any questions for this witness? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Thank Please you. be sure to leave your witness form. Absolutely. Anyone else in favor? Anyone else against? Anyone for information? Against? Come on. Please be sure to fill out a witness form and you may proceed when you're ready. Sure. Um, Chad McLaren, I'm a 20-year retiree from the military. Um, granted, when I went into service, you know, we had kind of an abstract notion of what defending the Constitution meant. Over years, I actually kind of refined my studies. Uh, ended up with a PhD just shy of the dissertation stage in public policy and administration. So um, it's always been one thing that really kind of has occupied my mind in consideration. Um, one thing that's kind of a common example within like our services might be, for example, the freedom of expression to burn the flag or to otherwise desecrate the flag that might be seen as um, insulting uh, to the service members who are meant to actually uphold the right to do so. Um, so in kind of an abstract theory, we protect the rights of people to behave in ways that we might find offensive, but most importantly, we do value their, their ability and their rights to <laughs> express themselves. Um, so I, I'm, I'm always skittish whenever we talk about first uh, amendment rights because um, I think the more that we try to legislate along these lines we leave ourselves open um, to some issues um, and abuses really is like what, what I'm concerned with um, and the issue of hate speech is one that I think is um, probably the most threatening aspect of what this bill permits um, I, I know like you know Milo was a popular speaker years back but really I mean he brought no academic 
credentials to his arguments. It was pretty much just, just open bigotry. And there was a small group of students that wanted to have him uh, speak on campus, and the campus denied him access because basically he's, uh, he's bigoted. Um, I don't think that we should be forcing our universities to provide a platform for these things that are antithetical to uh, the concept of education. Um, I, and I'm all for challenging ideas and for finding things that are uncomfortable and pushing your boundaries. But again, hate speech is one of those things that um, I, I think is, it does not need to be provided a platform. And this bill does kind of leave the door open to abuses along those lines. Um, and piggybacking, like I did not pick up on the and or argument earlier, but I would say that I am also in favor of the um, interpretation of or. Uh, the second thing is, um, if we are talking truly about First Amendment rights, our constitutional rights, I would like to know why this bill is limited to public institutions and not to private and religious organizations as well. That would be a major concern. I think this should be applicable to all higher education institutions and not just public. Thank you. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you. Anyone else in favor? Anyone else opposed? Anyone for informational purposes? You may proceed when you get ready. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, I'm Paul Wagner representing the Council on Public Higher Education, the, pub the chancellors, uh, presidents and chancellors of our public universities. Um, I've just got a couple things I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, again, we don't have a major problem with like any part of the bill. We don't have a, not really taking a side. There's a couple things I wanted that are, there are possible things that you might want to think about as the bill moves forward. One is on the top of page three um, in the new language that talks about uh, uh, free speech zones and establishing permitting, not establishing permitting requirements and such. We have a lot of areas that are kind of public-private partnership um, situation so for example at, at Cape Girardeau their show me center which is like their big event center kind of that's a, a in partnership with the city I um, mean the city might have certain uh, permitting requirements or security concerns or, or things that are their rules that may apply to space that is shared through through certain agreements and arrangements with colleges and universities and, and, and a lot of our uh, schools as well. I mean, that's even on like sidewalks and things like that. They're they're they're, they're uh, in partnership with um, a local municipality or, or a county or something. So we would want to make sure. Maybe we need to talk about that some more, so we have a better understanding of how those types of uh, things are uh, uh, are figured out. Um, I'd also draw your attention on page four, uh, section eleven starts on lane 112, which is about security fees that are charged. Um, last year, this committee added a sentence to the end of that, uh, uh, what's there right now in section 11, that basically said an institution can charge, so, so right now what the language in the bill says is that, is that you can't charge security fees, security fees based on the content of the speech um, or the anticipated reaction of <laughs> listeners. And we're perfectly fine with that. Um, last year, you added language that would have further clarified that we can charge security fees based on um, content neutral and viewpoint neutral criterion, such as the size of the audience, the time, length, and location of the event, and whether or not alcohol will be served. So I would, I would encourage you to put that sentence back in a, as you did last year. Um, and then also, I would also echo, um, I, I was about 50-50 on the general counsels that I heard from on the and or issue um, about whether or not this language expands the application of that and or distinction beyond the sexual harassment angle. You know, we talked about this some last year. Um, you know, th this could be read that uh, it says now, with respect to disciplining students for their speech, expression, or assemblies, uh, um, that the, the behavior has to be s severe, pervasive, and objectionably offensive. 
there might be such, you know, so if we can't discipline in any way any student, you know, if a student comes up and says, I'm going to take your lunch money every day starting today, and if you don't give it to me, I'm going to break your neck. That's not pervasive. It's just one, it's just one, oper it's just one interaction. But if there's no ability to discipline someone, or, or as, as the previous witness mentioned, if someone you know, goes off on a 15-minute rant, you know, throwing every ethnic slur in the book at someone of a particular ethnicity, it could be construed that this language would, would prevent, since it was just a one-time occurrence, that we could not discipline that student in any way. Um, and, you know, and there are a lot of situations that would come short of suspension or expulsion or something. So we would want to make sure that that is clarified in some way. It, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a problem, but it's something that um, caught our attention. So th those are just three things I would mention that um, just as legislators you may want to think about. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions for this witness? Representative Black. Mm -hmm. Thank you to inquire. Please. Uh, Mr. Wagner, apparently you have discussed with some institutions this paragraph that you've referenced on the top of page three regarding free speech zones. Yes. And um, I think I get the drift here that the bill is intending to limit uh, free speech activities. Uh, uh, prohibit institutions from limiting free speech activities to only a free speech zone or one or two free speech zones or whatever as designated on the campus. My question is, uh, in your review, do you understand if there's any limitation on the ability of a student group to invite a outside speaker or an internal speaker to pop up on any particular place in the campus if, if it's not if free speech zones are prohibited mm -hmm. is there any limitation on the location out in the out in the grounds not in classroom buildings but out in the grounds that would keep three or four of these things from happening at the same time? Is there any language in here that you've identified? Not to my understanding, there's not. That might be a question that someone else could answer better than me, but um, you know, that's something that we've talked about before with this, with this legislation. So again, it's something that um, could be litigated if it hasn't already been decided. Thank you. Representative Trent. To inquire. Please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also wanted to ask about the, the free speech zones. Uh, as I read the language, it seems like it would turn on whether or not the school actually controls or owns the property in question. But as I understood your testimony, you're concerned that it could also apply to property that the school does not own but has merely entered into some kind of agreement to use? Well, I, what, what I'm saying is I think there are some examples where there's, again, I, I could find out more detail, but there, where, there, where something is jointly owned or there's some kind of, it's not a black and white in terms of the university owns it or doesn't own it or controls it or doesn't control it because it's part of a partnership. Would you be more comfortable with this language if it did turn on ownership or exclusive control of the university? Uh, I would have to check on that, but I, I, it seems, from what I understand, it seems to me that that would be an improvement. I mean, it, it would seem to me that if you are using someone else's venue, that that venue would probably be in control, even under the existing language. But right, yeah, I mean, because that's the concern is that if you know, if we all, if we adopted all of this stuff, but then the city of Cape Girardeau has some uh, permitting requirement that runs afoul in the parking lot of the of the Show Me Center, then does that is that a 
liability, potential liability for the university. That, that was the concern is how those things intersect. All right. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Any other testimonies for informational purposes? Okay, seeing none, Representative Dorman, would you like to close? Um. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee for, for hearing this. Just a couple of things. Um, uh, certainly on the controversial, I, I think we can overcome that pretty easily. Uh, and then the, uh, the sentence we had last year that was just inadvertently left out, I don't, I don't see any problem with that. Um, just a couple of other things. Uh, we kind of get into this territory of, you know, when we're talking about threatening things and so forth, kind of legal and illegal behavior. Um, you know, speech is legal. Taking action on that speech can become illegal. Um, taking from someone in, in a threatening manner, even though you may never touch them, uh, you know, that, that becomes theft. You know, uh, you know, so there's kind of a, I would just keep, have people keep in mind, there is a line there uh, that's defined in law. Um, there's, as um, far as the grounds, it says public institution. So what's controlled by the public institution? Um, the, uh, let's see here. Um, I think noose has been defined as pervasive and severe in some lower court cases. Um, the, uh, the only thing I think I have left to, s to speak on is, or that, that definitely changes the standard. Uh, and is there for a reason. Um, and, uh, it's, it's solid. Um, changing that word out really changes the whole standard. So with that, uh, thank you all very much for listening to the, uh, the bill. Sure. Representative Shields, please. Yes. Um, the sentence you're going to add back in is the one about security. Um, it's the one we had last year. The one um, that, that Paul brought on up. Con yeah, on, on non-content cost factors. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, thank you, Representative. Thank you. Okay, this concludes the hearing on House Bill 2696, and the Committee on Higher Education is adjourned. <laughs>